grade request, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And I'm Professor Mark Sheriff. And Will, outside right now, I can hear the drills. I can hear the workers. Mm -hmm. Fiber is coming. Yeah, Fiber there's, is coming. There's a, there's a vocal group of people in my neighborhood opposing it. So that's going to be fun. Really? You already yes. have so much construction in the neighborhood already. Why would you try and... I, I, I will... My, so they gave a list of reasons. One was... Oh. It wasn't opposing to the construction. It was saying, one, well, if Ting is offering us this deal, maybe we should shop around for better deals. So they obviously <laughs> don't understand how cable networks work. Or, or, or utilities work, I guess. Yeah. And then the second was, um, sure, they say you could get, you know, 800 megabits per second but you could get less and if that falls below 10 then you won't be able to do video conferencing yeah and if a meteorite falls on my house i won't be able to do video conferencing but that isn't going to happen so that's going to be that's going to be a fun ar argument at the next hoa meeting I'm have ready. these people used cable internet before because my cable internet is very reliable at one thing going out at 11 a.m every day I yeah, do not I, yeah. know. I do not know. Uh, for those yeah. who can't see, which is everyone, I did a very, very visual shrug. It was a very, it was, it was an excellent shrug. Yeah. I, I felt the emotion through the video camera, but I went for a run today, which was probably my first mistake because it was rather warm here. Not like Portland warm, mm -hmm. which is an odd comparison, but from right now, that's, that's a thing. It's not Portland warm. Yeah. Warm in Charlottesville, Virginia today, but I decided to come back uh, to my house, kind of the back way around the neighborhood so I could watch and see where the project, pro the construction is going. And it is slowly creeping closer to my house mm -hmm. and it is glorious. And all I want to do, because these, these, the, the cable installation, there's these large tubes with, with mm -hmm. the fiber cable that are just sticking out of the ground at random spots, just where mm -hmm. they kind of drilled down. Cause they use this really cool drill that they just drill down and then under everything. And right. it comes back yeah. up the other end. Super cool. And I just want to run up and just grab the cable and just like, I don't know, inhale mm -hmm. the fiber. <laughs> yeah. Fiber is yeah. life. Well, I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I, I, yeah, I don't understand uh, some of the reasons that were given. Uh, anyway. Mm. Anyway, questions. I've, I've been jonesing <laughs> for questions. I've been, I've been apparently stalking through the UVA Reddit answering questions advising questions because i just need that mm. professorial hit so give me one give me a well, question so uh let's actually start not with the one question i was sitting at in our in our pre-show talk actually since we're talking about internet let's talk about this how is it that we can stream hg television through a service like direct tv with no problems but satellite internet is often slow and a horrible delay making it basically worthless Ah, this seems like this... an interesting question to what, you know, why, why, if we have all these satellites in space, right, which, which I hear that we do, um, why don't we just do all our internet through there? Why do we, why do we, why do we need to wait on cable when we could just use satellites and, and to I, space? I, if we could just beam the internet down into my head, mm -hmm. let's just do it. I mean, we watch um, I mean, cable tele. I mean, excuse me, satellite television. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's HD. People, yeah. you know, I get hundred. You get hundreds of channels through Direct TV, Dish Network, yeah, and, and whatever. They're, and they're great quality. In, in great theory. Qual assuming there's no raining. Assuming there's you no know. slightly bad weather. But that's now, we'll we'll get. So I've never. Yeah, exactly. I've never had um, satellite TV mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in my life or or satellite internet. However. My family has rented homes like in the mountains mm -hmm. where there aren't uh, cable lines. Right. And um, we did have satellite Internet. And I did notice, hey, I could watch a Netflix video, but I couldn't play Hearthstone. And yes. Hearthstone isn't exactly a high bandwidth activity. <laughs> yeah. And this is actually a, a, a common, um, you know, when, like when, when, when the COVID pandemic happened, everyone said, you know, hey, gamers, don't play games because it's going to use up all the bandwidth that people need for video streaming. And it's like, no, no. no. So, <laughs> so like HD television uses 
way more bandwidth than most games. Even very active games like shooters don't use anywhere near the bandwidth of streaming HD uh, movies or TV or, or, or whatever. And the that's another question. <laughs> yeah, that's another. Well, I guess I guess I won't get into that uh, today. We'll we'll talk about why that's the case another time. But then, so if if you can download that, then why can't you play games effectively, or why can't you quickly browse the internet? And the simple reason is, the internet is not a one way street. The internet is not something that comes into your house and you des- and you just digest it. Because you have to go out to the internet mm. and say, hey, I want to get this thing. And so it, it's two-directional. If you wanted to have, like, really good, reliable, you know, upload speeds and upload bandwidth and upload reliability, you would need the same thing that people need to get information to the satellites to begin with, which is incredibly expensive equipment. <laughs> That uh, stuff which, which you see you on top have, of your yeah. local TV station. Yes, <laughs> the, not the, stuff the power. You, in- yeah, that giant, really, really big satellite dish at your TV station, the one that makes you think probably being nearby is going to give you some type of illness. Yeah, <laughs> if that's what you would need to get that speed because that's what you need to have high-definition upload. So satellite is great for downloading, but uploading becomes a problem. And that's where you get, like, if they do a satellite interview on TV, you always get this significant lag often because even traveling at the speed of light, it has to go all the way up to space and down. So even if you had that equipment, you would still have lag that is worse often than what you would experience with a landline. But what's important to know is if you are talking about a one-way connection here, I am watching Mm -hmm. a Netflix video or something like that, and I hit go... Imagine for a fact that the Netflix servers are, let's call it, two minutes behind what you're mm-hmm. actually watching, what they're sending. But you don't care because once the stream starts coming to you, you can still watch it from beginning to end because there is no interactivity on your part. Mm-hmm. If you start trying to pause and move back and forth, you might see some weirdness going on. Right. Um, but yes, that uploads me. And even even we have complained, I have complained about my upload bandwidth with cable with cable internet, but even that, that's still 12 megabit is what I have as, as my mm-hmm. upload speed, which is well faster than, you know, even, you know, dial up and other, mm-hmm. I mean, it's still pretty dang fast. I mean, I'm still uploading YouTube videos in a reasonable amount of time. Don't get me wrong. Fiber is life. Want that fiber. It's going to be sweet, 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 but it's still good enough for what we're doing right now. I mean, we're on a video conference while we're also recording the podcast. Yeah. All right. So, um, generally, broadly, it just it, it has to do with the bi-directional nature of internet communication. Uh, downloading from satellite, you don't need super expensive equipment. You're just getting the signal as it comes down to you. But mm-hmm. uploading, that takes a lot more sophisticated equipment, a lot more expensive. Uh, as well as, again, if there's like, if it's like, you know... A couple of raindrops that day, you're you're basically SOL. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it might be good that our first question was a little bit shorter mm-hmm. because after some pre-show co- talk, our yes. second question might be a little bit longer. A little bit. And and this question actually showed up in my inbox because Ooh. just today I got an email from Mint. If you you know Intuit, the Mint application right, yes. for for doing financing. Yep, got an email automated email that said, oh, by the way, we now will handle your cryptocurrency. Yep. And the question, the question is, what is Bitcoin? And this is a very long yep. thing. But first, I, I we, we should break it down into, into two very quick things. And one of them, hopefully the question is yep. for you, because I have been trying to wrap my head around some of the, the technology mm-hmm. here. It's it's not easy. But the other part of it I want to talk about is just the notion of currency. Yes. So and I, and I, I actually think that would be the better place to start. Absolutely. That's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with Beanie Babies. Okay. And here's why I'm going to start with Beanie Babies. Uh, are you are you old enough to have yeah, been yeah. in the Beanie oh, yeah. Babies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 okay. yeah I, I very much remember uh, Beanie Babies. I apparently had an incredibly rare one without knowing it. And... um. I pulled the tag off because it was a toy to me and I didn't care. 
So it was worthless after that. But that's besides and the point. Went, and there went your college uh, education nah, I, money. I was fine. I, I, <laughs> I don't care. I. <laughs> Uh, of course, and that's yeah. fine. But let's ass- let, let, let's go back to the days of the Beanie Baby, mm-hmm. and Beanie Babies had value. Why? Mm-hmm. Why did they have value? Well, it turns out that any sort of thing can have value if people just mutually agree that they have yep. value. Value and that's is all. Sub- oh God. Yep. Yeah, value is subjective. Value yes. is whatever you have now. In, in most countries, we have a form of paper currency, mm-hmm. right? We have the U.S. dollar. Now, in the in, in, years ago, the U.S. dollar was actually a representative of the uh, a portion of gold bullion or silver or, or some other precious metal mm-hmm. that the government held in reserve. This is the Fort Knox thing. And the idea was that piece of paper was tied to something that had value. And so you could show that your ownership of some portion of it, that was worth a a place of storing value to trade for goods and services. Well, because of the fluctuations of gold and silver and, and whatever, most countries have gone to a fiat currency, which basically means this is money. Because we say it's money. Yes. And that's the only reason. And so yes. the paper money in the United States isn't even really paper money many times, right? Because most it's, times it's just yeah, it's cotton. It's okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yes, but it's it's numbers in a ledger somewhere yeah. uh, at your at your bank. And could it be turned into a physical representation that we all just agree has value? We can't. So beanie babies are Bitcoin. Because uh, sort of, but go ahead. Okay, no, let me finish my analogy, then you can rip it apart because yes. I love I love where I'm going with this. Let's assume that there's only one type of beanie baby and they all have the same value. Okay. I'm taking out the oh, you've got the special mm-hmm. holiday bunny or whatever it was, okay? But if we all agree that beanie babies have value, then we can exchange beanie babies for goods and services. And specifically, um, we could we could also exchange parts of Beanie Babies. So we could chop up a Beanie Baby and I could give you a Beanie Baby head. And that's just Wouldn't the beans some fall value. Out? No, because this is my magic environment. Okay, that the right, the head it, just comes it. off and I could hand that over. To so Bitcoin is has value because people, some people have said that it has value. Mm-hmm. It is transportable. It is yes. something that we can transfer to other people reliably. Um, it is uh, divisible. Matter of fact, you can go down to what is it? Something a, a ten to the negative eight? I, I mean, it's like I actually eight. I've I, I've never tried to go that far. So I'm, uh, yeah, a, sat- a satoshi. I I've believe never, is the I've smallest. I've never bought Bitcoin, but we'll get to why in a second. Uh, a satoshi, I believe, is the smallest amount of Bitcoin that one person can have. Mm-hmm. And so, because of this. Some some places, some people, some governments even, I believe I just read that El Salvador, I believe it was, just in the last few months has accepted Bitcoin as, as an official currency for use in the country. I think is the first country that has done this. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's a digital beanie baby kind of thing that you can trade with other people. Now, can you tell me where they come? Hey, so, hey, Will, hey, yeah. Will. Where where do Beanie Babies come from? Where do my special yeah. Beanie Babies come from? Well, allow me to uh, before we go on. Let me let me try to give a definition that I'm going to have for currency for the purpose of talking about Bitcoin, which is currency is more or less a means of short circuiting the barter system. Yes, uh, the the, the idea is you know. You and I provide the services of teaching computer science to 18 to 22 year olds broadly. I mean, some exceptions, (laughs) but broadly, that's that is our contribution to society. That uh, that sounds so awful when you put it like that. (laughs) And and so if I went to the grocery store, I I don't have a means to negotiate at the grocery store. Hey, you know, I taught these kids (laughs) over here. How much food can I get? No, yeah. no, no. You go to the registry and say, let me tell you about garbage collection yeah. in Java, and then yeah, you walk yeah, yeah. off with a pizza. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's just like, no, here, I'll teach you some code, and then I'm going to need, like, some bread. That, <laughs> so, so effectively, no, effectively what happens is I 
agree with the University of Virginia how much my services are worth, and then I get effectively a receipt saying here is what we think it's worth in the form of paper because it is a fiat currency. I don't receive actual percentage ownership of the gold repository. Um, and then I can take that to anywhere and they will accept that. And the reason, one of the big reasons this works is because there really isn't an alternative. Now, uh, you know, and then, then we're going to get into Bitcoin and how that's potentially an alternative. But for most of the time, it's just that was the money you had. And and so we we assume it has value because it's always had value. It's going to continue to have value, uh, presumably for a while, hopefully, knock on wood. Um, but now, so, so it's effectively a way to short circuit the barter system, but you're trading goods and services for goods and services. It's just a receipting system. That's how I'm going to define uh, 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 the currency that you use, the dollar bills, the, your credit card, etc. And I'm going to then differentiate that to how most people end up using cryptocurrency. So first, let's talk about how it works. There, the idea of Bitcoin is strictly digital. There are, of course, not physical coins. You don't need a thumb drive. It is actually a remote repository. You don't even have a file on your computer that says that these are the Bitcoin indexes that you have or whatever. There, there's nothing like that. Instead, Bitcoin is stored in something called a blockchain. And a blockchain, it sounds complicated, but if you break it down, I think the right way it ends up being fairly simple. First, a blockchain is a chain of blocks. I know that seems uh, obvious, but... What, I'm with you so far. What What is a block? So a block is data that says, here are all the transactions that occurred. And the reason you need this is because you need to avoid the double spending problem, which is unique to digital currencies. Um, if you, to, to explain what the double spending problem would be like, imagine if I went to the supermarket, I gave them a $10 bill and said, you know, here's the $10 bill. But then I took that same $10 bill, which I had somehow made a copy of, say, counterfeit, and I spent it somewhere else. So I, with $10, I have purchased $20 worth of goods and services. Schrodinger's bill. It's right. It's two, but kind of, eh, whatever. So, now that doesn't really, that's, that's not as big a problem in the real world, because really that's just counterfeit detection. But if, if the counterfeits were, say, hypothetically perfect, the only way to verify that a transaction was legitimate would be to actually look at the serial numbers and track the serial number of each bill or track the, uh, the movement of each Bitcoin or each fragment of a Bitcoin. So that's the idea. The block, each individual block contains a bunch of transactional data. Now, the chain aspect relies on hashing. We've talked a bit about hashing before. The idea is a hashing is you put some collection of stuff in and you or you put some information in and you get a big number out. How big is this number? Uh, 64 hexadecimal digits, which is uh, 2 to the power of 8 to the power of 64, which is citation needed a really, really big number. <laughs> right. Um, you put it in a calculator. See what you get. I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's not going to it's not going to be good. Um, all right. So from there, that hashing number is produced by some function. Then that is uh, that hashing number is stored in that block. And then the next block also stores that same hashing number. So the blocks are chained together, and each block contains both its own data and hash, and also the hash of the previous block. Why would we do this? Well, uh, as, I, as we mentioned, this is on the internet. This is not even hard to, to get access to the blockchain. But if someone tries to manipulate and say, no, 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 that transaction, I only spent five Bitcoin, not 10 Bitcoin, so I still have five Bitcoin. If someone tries to modify that data, that will change the data enough that the hash no longer matches that data. And mm -hmm. so if you were to change the hash on a block and say like, okay, well, I manipulate the data and I manipulate the hash, well, the next block will say, whoa, 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 what's going on here? 
The hash of the previous block just changed. It no longer agrees with me. We need to figure out what happened. And that allows you some security to prevent people from putting in fraudulent transactions in the past. So three things in a blockchain. The data, that is, here are the transactions. Steve bought a PlayStation 5 for 10 Bitcoin, whatever. Um, which would which would probably be what the... That's a lot of money, but I, I don't know if you've so seen... So the scalpers me. are asking now. Yeah, the, the, the scalpers really are out of control. Um... So that, that's then the hash code for that data and then the hash code for the previous. And so all blockchains start with the Genesis block, which there is no previous hash. And so that's zero, zero, zero. Okay, so that's how you prevent transactions. But what if someone is really good and they manage to change several blocks? So they don't just change the hash in this box, but they change the hash in the next box, which, by the way, would cause them to have to change the hash in every future box because it carries over. Well, in order to prevent that, you have a distributed system. So a bank is going to have, say, a central server that says Will McBurney has this much money in his bank account. And every time a transaction comes in, it you know, either deducts or adds to that balance. In order to do this in a distributed way, or in order to hack a distributed system, you would need to gain access to 50% plus one of the blockchains and manipulate all of them to get them all to say, hey, you know, Will has $5, which which for the note, this 51% problem does actually affect uh, one of like some of the very small bitcoins that are just getting started, Obvi- or not bitcoins, excuse me, cryptocurrencies. Obviously, it doesn't affect Bitcoin. Bitcoin's way too big now, but there are some small cryptocurrencies where this has occurred. Uh, this is also why you shouldn't trust the new cryptocurrency. But that's besides the point. Okay, so that's the mechanics of how it works. Now, how do you get Bitcoin? Well. In order to ensure that there's a lot of people auditing transactions to make sure that they are working, you incentivize people to audit transactions by offering them the cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. So in Bitcoin specifically, you have to audit one megabyte of transactions. And then at that point, you can start to mine for cryptocurrency. There's the, 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 so this goes back to the hash function. This is where we we run into some of the many issues with cryptocurrency. Because so far, yes, this is a distributed system, but it's okay. But when you, as I said, you you put a number into the function and it produces uh, it produces a hash, and that hash is you know it's it's hard to predict. It's very very hard to predict. As in, human beings can't do it. Even advanced computers can't do it. They cannot reverse engineer the hash. So it's very unpredictable. So what happens is everyone effectively plays guess a number in order to guess, well, what is the hash of this next box going to be? And every 10 minutes or so, they'll say, oh, here's the here's the next hash, you know, and uh, the 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 first person to enter a number that hashes to a value Le- equal to or less than the hash of the actual box wins. Now, to be clear, you can't just guess zero because zero probably hashes to a bigger number than the target hash. Because um, remember, it, it, you say a number that goes into a function that you can't see and can't predict, and it outputs that number, and it's that output number that needs to be equal to or less than the target hash. This allows them to configure the difficulty. If there's a large number of people mining, they make the target hashes smaller, and if there's a small number, they can make it larger. So it configures the difficulty. Originally, the so- difficulty started at 1, now it's like 13 trillion. So it's 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 really difficult now. So that's the mining. And if you guess the number, that block gets added to the blockchain and you get credit for adding it. So that's so you have contributed the service of auditing transactions and you get some reward of bitcoins. Right now I think it's it's six and a quarter or six and a half that you get per Something block. Something like that. Yeah. So, so, so let me, let me, let me wrap, let me summarize really quick yes. for, for, for non-technical people and see if that, which includes me in this. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we have a, let's, let's call it a robust system for auditing who owns what and what transactions happen, because basically a bunch of people agree to be 
bankers for free mm -hmm. by running their computer 24 seven, burning down rainforests, yada, yada, yada. And it's just we'll constantly talk about happening. The environmental damage in a second. But yeah, yeah okay. On. Well, yeah, we'll get through it. Um, then the Bitcoin itself is created by basically there being the lotto <laughs> where you have a yeah. one in 16 million chance of winning and yes. everyone tosses in. And if you happen to guess the lotto number, you're like, congratulations, that well, lotto number is lotto now. Number. There's a lot whenever. of lotto numbers that hit, but okay, it's still but a tiny fraction. Anyway, no, I, I just want to make that clear because it is relevant. Someone will correct Regardless, me. Regardless, but yeah. you, whoever, whoever guesses correct first, whatever the definition, whatever yes. first and correct. Okay. Whatever the definition of first and correct is, but whoever one, someone guesses correct. And that minor is successful. Congratulations. More Bitcoin has been added. Yes. And from what I understand that because of the algorithm, um, there is a cap on the total number of Bitcoin that can be um, mined overall at like 21, 21 billion, million. 21 it's about million. 18.4 now. Uh, it'll be and it's right supposed now, to it's cap at 2040. Million. Yeah. So it's uh, like 21, by 2040, 2140. 2140. 20, 2140. That's much they, further away than they 2040. Have, they, so they have to pay out roughly every four years. Um, so what say, so like, you know, 2009, when it started, you got like, uh, you know, 20 currency or something, or you got like 25 or Bitcoin, no, it was 50 Bitcoins right. originally. Then you got 25, then you got 12.5 and now it's like, it's uh 6.5. So they're having roughly every four years. Anyway, go ahead. Right. Right. So it, th this is equivalent kind of mm -hmm. to the, the fed only putting out a certain amount of cash in circulation Correct. at a time, kind of like that. So at the end of the day, mm -hmm. A Bitcoin for for just average lay people is think of it like this. You have a banking account at Wells Fargo. And if you never take out cash ever, mm -hmm. it's just a number of how much of something you have mm -hmm. that people agree has value. Bitcoin is just a different type of that in a different computer system managed a different yes. way. But at the end of the day, it's just another thing that do people agree that this have has value or not? So now I know you have strong feelings about this. Yes. Does it have value? And let's try to keep it under like a few Yes. Yeah, so I, I apologize that, 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 that explanation went long, but it is, it is complicated enough. They think it no, more to that. Explanation. It is important. No, no, no. It's so, very important. It was, it was, I learned, I yes. learned. So, so it was the more, the more I know. Yeah. So here is why I don't like cryptocurrencies. Um, the, the, so as I said before, I, I like to think of a currency as something that you receive for goods and services that you provide, that you can exchange for goods and services you want. It is a short circuit of the barter system. And Bitcoin can be used that way. Uh, there are companies that accept Bitcoin. Um, but often what cryptocurrencies are currently being used for is as a quote unquote financial investment. Um, that mm -hmm. is the idea is that you want to buy low and sell high. The, the problem with this like is beanie babies. I, well, but okay. So let's talk about another, <laughs> let's talk about something equally useless as beanie babies. GameStop stock, right? Oh no. I like GameStop, but, <laughs> but what you saw with the GameStop thing. So first it was the short squeeze. Okay. That happens all the time, but the media, uh, the media attention around it led to a public rush that actually turned into a Ponzi scheme. It was a pump and dump Ponzi scheme. It just was. You know, the, the people who got on board first made a lot of money. And the people who got on board late paid that money. Because it is a transfer of people who get in early and get out at the right time. If you jump in late, and then you hold on, like like they publish, hold on to that stock, hold on to it. Diamond hands. Well, well, guess what? That's so that way the people who started this can sell their sell their shares before you and make money. That's what happened with GameStop. I, I it, it, it was a pump and dump. It very much was. Yes, it was paired with a short squeeze, which is a legitimate investment strategy. But it was a, it was all the media attention around it led to a pump and dump. And the problem is you see this all the time people lost their livelihoods the la like in, in about three years ago when bitcoin got popular and it skyrocketed to ten thousand, fomo kicked in and the media coverage kicked in and everyone's like well 
crap, I got to go out and get me some Bitcoin. And then the price tanked and people put their life savings in it because they thought, well, this can only go up because the attention indicated that. And online sources, many of whom already have money in Bitcoin, are like, oh, yeah, it's totally a safe investment. Quick, sell, 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 sell. No, 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 it's fine. Keep buying more. Yep. It, it, it turns into this pump and dump a lot of the time. And th this is where I distinguish it from the, the currency of trading for goods and services. It is currency traded for currency. You are, too many people right now are viewing crypto as like company stock. But the difference between company stock and cryptocurrency is the company stock is actually ownership in a thing. It is, it is a company that you own a portion of. That company has a value because it's trading with other people. The only way you make money on cryptocurrencies like Dogecoin, which, you know, or, or more obscure ones that can't be traded like Bitcoin, is you convince someone to buy, 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 you, uh, buy the coin from you. You convince someone you else that it has it. value. Yeah, you but convince you, but someone you convince else someone that it has someone, value. It has more value than you have. That's a pump and dump. Like, oh, no, I'm going to buy this, convince everyone it, it sells for more. And then I'm going to sell it to them at a higher price. It it's I mean it's it's a Ponzi scheme in in a lot of these cases. And so yeah, it is. Um, it's also incredibly unstable because it's largely based on media coverage. Case in point, cryptocurrencies plummeted when Elon Musk on Saturday Night Live said, "Oh yeah, it's just it's just uh, what was the phrase he used? Uh, it's a hustle. It is. It's mm -hmm. a hustle." I mean, I'm not saying it can't be, and I and I actually do like some of the ideas of a decentralized currency that is not owned by a government because, you know, you can see, for example, uh, Germany post World War One, their their currency plummeted. You see this in countries all the time. It very well could happen in any industrialized nation if they have a series of bad policy decisions. So I get the the idea of it, but there's there's the ideal. And there's how it's being used. And more and more I'm seeing it used in pump and dump Ponzi schemes. And that bothers me. That really bothers me. Sure. No, and it, and, and, and it rightfully should. You know, I, I think that this is... I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate to what you mm -hmm. said. Uh, but in some way that, you know, when, when trying to... When you said that, you know, trying to sell the currency... Mm -hmm. Well, what you what, what's happening there is you're effective, quote unquote, converting back to a currency that is understood and stable and people, all mm -hmm. people recognize that it has value as opposed to the thing that people don't aren't all mm -hmm. sure whether it has value or not. Right. And the only way for something to move into the realm of being on the equivalence level of a fiat currency from a from a government mm. is for universal acceptance. Right. And so, you know, I, 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 there, I think there is a, a, a world, a time, a place where this could happen potentially, yeah, I, but I due to, but due to the general geopolitical nature of the world, I don't know if we will be around necessarily to see it, but this is, this is outside of my, re I am not an economist. Yeah. From a technical point of view, they're digital Benny babies. I think, I mean, it, it's, it's what all Ponzi schemes rely on. That is the pred predation of the ignorant. It, it's relying a lot on social ignorance of blockchains and cryptocurrency and, and the nature of them to make it think that it's like a company stock, that it's something you should primarily buy for the purposes of selling later. That's what I disagree with. As a speculation. Because that, that's just speculation at that point. And hey. uh, it's speculation of a of a non-commodity. I, I And I don't even like, you know, there's issues with speculations of, of literal commodities like oil, etc. But... It's different when it's truly imaginary. <laughs> so that's... Yeah. I, I mean, the difference between that and a fiat currency, which is in a sense imaginary, is that there is government backing. I mean, the, the FDIC yes. back... Again, we are not economists. But, we are computer scientists. Well, well, the difference is the universal acceptance, but also the lack of ignorance. And and don't get... And yes, there's a lot of ignorance around financial policy and, and economics, but there's the idea that the dollar isn't going to rapidly fluctuate over the next, like, two weeks. 
You can't no. say the same for cryptocurrency. And the reason for that rapid fluctuation is largely, A, because it's primarily speculative. It's not based on uh, uh, what goods and services you can trade it for. But basically, when you, you trade your currency into Bitcoin, wait for it to grow, and then trade it back into the concrete currency that you can spend locally. I, I and, and so I think it's, it is predation on human ignorance. And I always find that um, morally repug- repugnant. I'm not saying every cryptocurrency is guilty of this, but the the general media apparatus around cryptocurrency and the the Reddit pages and the websites, I think, very much encourage predation. Should we transfer to something a little more lighthearted yes. now? Is it time, uh, is yeah, it time sure. to change gears? Here, here's something lighthearted. Uh, why can't we launch nuclear waste into the sun? Why? Why? Oh, oh I, I can see the, the gears turning. Uh, so let, let's let's talk about how how this idea is one of those ideas that, when you think about it for exactly one second, you think, "Huh," and then when you think about it for exactly two seconds, you're like, "Oh my god!" Why? Why? Would, okay. So first, um, let's just talk about some orbital physics. If I may. <laughs> okay, okay, please. Did you know that the hardest no, the hardest place to launch anything in the solar system is to the sun? It is it is harder to get something into the sun than it is to get it out of our solar system. Here's why. I did not. Okay, yeah, I'm interested so, in this. So first, you're running what is, the Venus. What is the gravity at the altitude of the ISS? What is the gravity that Earth is pulling on the ISS relative to the gravity here? Is it like 1%, 2%? No, it's about 90, 91%. I was about to say, it is close to the same, is what yeah, I was going to say. It's about yeah. 90, 91%. But then why does it look like things are, are in zero gravity? Well, that's because... Gravity doesn't really work that way. You what what happens is it the 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 I the I the International Space Station is constantly in free fall towards the planet Earth. The problem is we've shot it so fast moving uh counterclockwise around the Earth, counterclockwise assuming north is up. Someone will complain about that, but anyway. Um it's moving so fast that as it falls towards the Earth, the Earth curves underneath it. So you're actually in free fall. It, it is, so when you, when you see zero gravity, it looks so fun. Okay, imagine that feeling you get when an elevator lurches downward, but that feeling is constant and inescapable. That's what zero gravity feels like. Yeah, that is not anything... No. Yeah, it is. It I is. can't do roller coasters. I can't do. No. I can do roller coasters. No. But mm. anyway, now realize that we're doing that around the sun. Think of it like if you were say say you were on a train, you wanted to jump off, and you saw a mattress up ahead. So you're gonna jump right as the mattress is beneath you, right? No, because then you'll overshoot it. Because the problem is when you jump off the train, if the train's moving 50 miles an hour, you're still moving 50 miles an hour in the same direction as the train. You've just added a small amount of velocity away from the train. So you have to jump when the mattress is way ahead of you because when you land, you'll, you'll still be moving 50 miles an hour the direction of the train. The Earth is moving around the sun at 30 kilometers per second, which is... Uh, fast. <laughs> In order to have something go from the Earth to the sun, you can't just aim at the sun and fire your rockets because you're moving counterclockwise around the sun. You will miss the sun in the counterclockwise direction because your existing motion is carrying you 30 kilometers a second. And in fact, you'll move, if you aim your rockets at the sun, aim your spaceship at the sun and fire the rockets and just keep burning until you get there, not only will you miss the sun, you'll actually go farther from the sun than when you started on the other side. Because orbital mechanics don't work that way. You can't just aim at a target and fire your rockets. I know it works in... um, But but Star Trek works that way. Well, that's why I would actually recommend playing... um, I would recommend playing... Uh, the Outer Wilds, because when you try oh, to God. aim at a planet and fly there, you can't actually do it. You need to match the velocity of the planet and then approach it. So anyway, 
So how can you get to the sun without missing it? Well, here's how you do it. The Earth is rotating counterclockwise. You get up, you get out of Earth orbit, you point your rockets in the opposite direction, and you burn your rockets as much as you can to slow down 30 kilometers per second, which is, is so costly in terms of fuel to do that we don't bother to do it that way. We try to do all these advanced gravity assists around Venus and Jupiter, so it takes forever to actually get to the sun. So that's the first... By comparison, I should note, if you aim in the same direction as Earth's rotating and you burn only uh, 12 kilometers a second or 14 kilometers a second, I can't remember which, you will escape the solar system out to infinity. So whenever someone says Ooh. launch something into the sun, no, that's stupid. That's ridiculous. Launch it into outer space out beyond our solar system. Uh, right? That's that's what we should do. Someone else's problem. That's what, that's what should happen to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> what? No, no, what? I didn't know. I did whoa, not whoa. say that. No, what? <laughs> All right. So now, that's the orbital physics reason why launching nuclear waste into the sun is a bad idea. There you go. But why is it a bad idea? Well, I don't know. Maybe because rockets blow up sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other side of it is uh, uranium is heavy because, you know, it has all those protons and neutrons in it, right? It's very, very heavy and dense. And it costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $10,000 per pound launched into space. So that's incredibly cost ineffective. And, and by the way, that actually doesn't scale linearly. It scales worse. So the more weight you want to put on a rocket, it, it costs more per pound to get it into space. So we have to send up tons of rockets to do this. How, how do you know the per pound to send stuff? It's not like how much, you know, a, a half a pound of turkey at the deli costs. This is not like a, like yeah. a, like a yeah, it, measurement. It, well, that's a rough estimate based on how many pounds we put into space and how okay. much that costs, right? But the problem you are is... a treasure trove of information, the, my the, friend. The more weight that you have, the more fuel you need. But you also well, need sure. fuel to carry that fuel up. And you need fuel to carry that fuel up. And so it actually is, is, is a uh, pseudo-exponential growth. Well, not so it is an exponential growth. It's an exponential growth of fuel you need per pound. So, anyway. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. All right. So that's why All that's right. a bad idea. Oh, man. All right. Because well, of every possible reason. That's that's the real reason. Every possible reason. Well, we're going to stay in the tech area, okay. kind of. Um, I, I, I got this, this question in my email last week, and I've been holding it. Um, I would say it's from a listener, but there's no way in the world. Um, as a lead up to this, are, are you familiar with the term boondoggle conference? I'm familiar with the term boondoggle. I have not heard it used in conjunction with the word conference. Well, my my learned academic friend who is in the first few years of his academic professorship, there are conferences in every discipline in which oh, I they get email involved in that. Yeah, oh, they, you should. Sorry. You should. You should. Where they say, oh, we would very much appreciate your learned presence at our amazing conference. Please pay us money and oh, we will okay. publish yeah, your yeah. paper. Yeah. Yeah. But these are these pay, are pay to publish predatory journals. Yes. Predatory journals, predatory conferences. And yeah. usually they come with, let's say, colorful sounding emails. Oh, yeah. That yeah, I, I've seen might have gone okay. through some. OK, well, this is one of those. But the question is so good. All right. So good. And I want to read you. I want to read you the a couple first paragraphs for, for this particular conference. The title of the email is Mark Sheriff. Can robots take over dentistry? <laughs> Dear Mark Sheriff. <laughs> Here's the thing. I, I'd totally be okay with that. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Greetings for the day. Hope this email finds you in the best of health and spirit. Is robotics a boon or bane for dentists? The quest for dental advancements is never ending. From traditional techniques to the digital world, dentistry has experienced enormous changes and breakthroughs, broadening the spectrum of dental care and operations. The art of robotics used in the field of dentistry is highly fascinating. The robot is one of science's most amazing inventions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. These devices can imitate life. Robot <laughs> <laughs> Robots 
robots. Sorry, robots. Uh, up until now, I'm like, yeah, this is okay. All right, robot as a single technology, whatever. But in, I- imitate life. Okay, yeah, go okay. ahead. Hey, rob- robots reduce human error, enhance work efficiency, mm-hmm. and shorten the time it takes to complete a task because of this robotics has already started to blossom in the field of dentistry. That yeah. was actually one sentence. Yeah, but, but that's a completely cool. fair sentence. Yeah, okay, okay here we go. Despite the fact that the robotic world of precision and accuracy is addressed and applied in many sectors, it still has limitations. The expense of setting up a robotic surgery system can drive up the price of an operation. Mm -hmm. Surgical robots are expensive to maintain, and operating them necessitates additional training, which is also costly. Mm -hmm. The issue of latency, the time it takes for the robot to carry out the surgeon's directions, is one of those serious issues with robotic surgery. To address the aforementioned issues, a closer association between researchers, dentists, and experts in this area is required. We invite you to come to Las Vegas, Nevada, May 2nd through 4th, 2022. (laughs) in Las Vegas. Go ahead. Of course it is. Um, It'll be like a room. They'll have booked like a room and it won't even be a suite. It'll just be like two beds and like a bottle of Aquafina that costs $4. And that'll be the conference. And here is the piece de resistance. The theme of the conference is smile. Shaping dentistry with multifaceted innovations and leveraging enhanced technologies. So... Is robotics a boon or bane for dentists? <laughs> uh, that I'm going to have to punt for now because I think we need to do a whole discussion on the singularity and I would I can tell that I would end up going that direction. Um so, <laughs> so, so I don't want to answer this question by explaining what the singularity is cuz we're already at like the 45 minute mark. Well, let's just let's just top this off by saying yeah. do surgeons in various fields do things like telemedicine, where there is a surgeon, a mm-hmm. remote surgeon, that is operating a device remotely. So, I mean, imagine this. You have an mm-hmm. expert in Ohio, and you need a surgery immediately in Florida, mm-hmm. picking places, and um, they are able to set up this this link, and they are able to use the same digital mm-hmm. tools remotely as they are locally, now, whether any of this is fully automated, I mean, there's certainly automated things mm-hmm. that people use. I mean, like an MRI, I mean, yeah. that is a tool that does a recording. We actually have a colleague that has done experiments on people programming while inside an MRI to see what parts of their brain yes, fire I think I saw while that. they're programming. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's great. Wes Weimer, great yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. University of Michigan. Yeah. Um, but... Um, whether we have have expanded these to dentistry yet, I haven't registered for the conference. I guess I need to do that so I can find out. Well, I mean, you know, obviously we're both known for our great dental research, which is why we're <laughs> teaching uh, <laughs> students how to write introductory programs. Well, how I'm doing, anyway. Writing students how to write introductory programs in Java and Python. Um <laughs> Yeah, I just to be clear, I think that's actually a valid area to do research and development in. But oh, it, but course. if they're emailing you to go to Las Vegas, but you need to pay and they'll publish whatever paper, probably they're they're not they're not on the up and up. I'll go out on a limb and guess. So there is the line. We we would like to invite you as an honorable speaker at our conference. Our attendees will look forward to hearing and listening to your groundbreaking research. Yes, I'm sure they're very yes. interested in the dentistry conference about my research into how people teach computer science. How people teach computer science and what makes a video game good. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, what, right. and what right makes there. what makes a dental exam fun? Not much. What makes not not much. I did have a dentist who had video games in their exam room for kids. Yeah. So so maybe maybe there's the crossover. Hey. I my my <laughs> dentist is Dr. Swisher and you know I don't think you can top that name for a dentist. No. That, so, that's a good name. You know. That's a good name. Yeah, it is. All right. yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. We will have to talk about the singularity at some point, but I'll I'll let it go for another day cuz I've I've oh, spoken like goodness. 40 minutes of this. That I have it's, uh, hey, I had quite the diatribe on what beanie babies are, yes. but that will 
that will do it for us today. Thank you all so much for hanging out with us for the last 40 to 45 minutes going into such things as Bitcoin, satellite, internet, and now dental robotics. If you have not yet subscribed on the podcast service of your choice, we would very much appreciate you doing so. You can go to regraderequest.com to find all of the links to all of the different services that are out there. Tell a friend. We'd love to have a few more listeners than apparently my family. And you know, there's, there's a few more than my family. I, I just uh, estimated that my family makes up about 25% of our total listenership <laughs> at this, at this early phase of, of my of family's podcasting. probably another 25. So, and I love them all. They're all yeah. wonderful people, but thank you. Thank you all. Uh, if you have a question that you would like for us to answer on the podcast, you can email us at hosts at regraderequest.com or at regraderequest.com you can find a button to record an audio message that we could play on the show if you happen to have the Anchor FM app installed on your iOS or Android device you can also record your message there so and if you and if you, and, and if you have complaints about my opinions on bitcoin uh, you can write it down on a piece of paper and if you take it to your local recycling bin i have a system where i'll get it so so just trust me it's always going to be there. So for myself and Professor Mick Burney, as always, watch for falling goats. Indeed. Take care. Take care, everyone. And watch, and you can buy those, you can buy those goats with, with Bitcoin. You can buy yeah. them things. I, a nice goat sweater. Yeah. A, a falling goat-based barter system. Mm, how, many bo- how many goat coins do you have? <laughs>